So let me introduce uh, today's uh, speaker. Um, so the webinar is provided by Greg Willis. Uh, Greg is uh, responsible uh, for the outreach and he is co-lead of the whole tail project, uh, a project I think mainly supported by, by NSF for several years now. Um, whole tail uh, makes it possible to have your science uh, reproducible and therefore transparent and you know, having reproducible science is uh, is the pillar of of science. I think uh, if you cannot reproduce, if somebody else cannot reproduce your science, then you know your your outcome might be uh, questionable. So so I think this this whole tail project is uh, is a very important uh, element. Um, so I'm I'm pleased to that you uh, that you can join for this presentation. Um, hotel developers have created a wonderful gateway, uh, so please uh, visit that and I'm sure uh, Greg will, uh, will point you uh, at some point to it. Um, and, but the gateway is there for you, you can, you can post your, your workflow basically there and others can uh, follow the steps you have taken uh, to get to uh, the findings you, you present, for example, in the paper. Um, some logistics uh, regarding this webinar. So we're, we're recording the webinar. So please keep your uh, microphone muted, mic, your mic muted, as well as your uh, camera uh, for now. Um, if you have questions uh, during the presentations, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and after the presentation, uh, me or, or Lynn will uh, read them out and uh, hopefully Greg can uh, answer uh, some of those. Um, after the webinar, uh, the recordings will be posted on the CSDMS website. It, it will take a couple of hours, but uh, we, we will keep it there for you to review or if you want to point colleagues to it or something. Um, all right, uh, with that, Greg will uh, present today uh, publishing transparent and reproducible computational research with Holtil. And with that, Greg, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Thank you, Albert. And good, good afternoon for me. Good morning for uh, those of you, <laughs> depending on your time zone. I might get my desktop shared here. So yeah. As I said, I'm Craig Willis, and uh, so I'll present about Whole Tail. Um, I'm at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in the School of Information Sciences. I've worked on Whole Tail now. The project's in its seventh year. Uh, I've been on it, I think, for five or six, and uh, so quite a while. So just very simple agenda. I'll cover a little bit of Whole Tail, the background, some of the concepts that underlie the platform. And then I actually spend most of the time walking through the platform, showing you uh, some of its capabilities, and then some time on um, questions. And I'm good because I'm going to be looking at another monitor. I'm going to stop my video if that's okay. Get an old picture of me. So, Whole Tail is, as Albert mentioned, NSF funded uh, the old Data Infrastructure Building Blocks Program, now CSSI. And as such, the goal of the project was intended to rebuild usable, reusable infrastructure. Um, what we've developed and con are continuing to develop is an open source platform for computational transparency and reproducibility. And I'll talk about our definition of that in just a second. Um, and the platform is intended to help researchers create, publish, and then enable uh, review, like assessment and verification of computational research artifacts. <clears throat> and in the platform, we call these artifacts tails. Uh, you'll see them called capsules by other similar platforms. <clears throat> so there's the project websites there and the, the dashboard. So we operate an instance of whole tail hosted on NSF's uh, Jetstream 2 cloud. Um, and I'll use during the demonstration, what I will say is that very sadly, about an hour before <laughs> this presentation, uh, Jetstream had a network outage. Uh, so hopefully the my demonstration will go well. I may flip over to another instance that we have for another project if needed. Uh, so it was an unfortunate but typical incident. So this it's a public dashboard, and I'll walk you through um, using it. So what do we mean by computational reproducibility and transparency? 
Um, whole tale really takes this narrow view of computational reproducibility that's uh, from the National Academy's definition, which is really getting the same results using the same data, the same computational steps, methods, code, conditions of analysis. So some people would term this repeatability. So the broader ideas of reproducibility and replicability where a uh, whole tail platform is in support of these, but as a technical solution, it's really about enabling people to re-execute you're in a computational workflow or an analysis from a point in time, trying to retain as much as we can about the environment, uh, the information about the software that was installed, the software used, et cetera, and the data that was used. So we see transparency as um, providing enough information so that others can assess your results without necessarily repeating them. And I think what we like to recognize that the notion of repeatability for reproducibility isn't always feasible or even desirable. You know, there's a lot of good reasons why uh, someone may not be able to simply re-execute your published code. You might have proprietary data or sensitive data. You might have long-running or large-scale computation. So uh, we see transparency is equally as important, even if someone were not to uh, actually re-execute. Oh, thank you. I'm oh, sorry. I was just checking the chat. So uh, one of the motivating use cases for whole tail um, is actually as the project evolved is the kind of increasing adoption of reproducibility policies and audits as a part of the peer review process. And I understand this isn't really a, a widespread in the geosciences, <clears throat> but in some of the fields that we work with, we see journals not only requiring that authors share computational research artifacts, including the data and the code, but in some cases, those artifacts are subject to review to confirm that they actually reproduce reported results. So two groups that we work with closely is uh, the Odom Institute that implements the verification policy for the American Journal of Political Science <clears throat> and the um, American, the data editor for the American Economic Association, where they have a fairly strict code of, uh, data and code availability policy across the eight or nine journals that publish empirical research. My context here. All right. So, what is a tail? This is kind of one of the core concepts of whole tail. Um, so, it is a research object, and if you don't know that concept, it's really intended to capture information about all of the artifacts involved in the research process beyond just publication or just a data set. Um, so technically speaking, a whole tail tail is um, like a, could be a zip, archi a zip archive in, of a particular format that's got data, it's got code, it has documentation, which the results of the computation, information about the environment, um, tails are intended to be executable, so they're designed for someone to, what underlies this is Docker, so what, it's designed for somebody to reinstantiate that environment, that image, uh, to be able to explore, assess, re-execute, uh, publish research. And whole tail itself doesn't, is not an archive, so the platform, uh, tails can be stored there, shared, used there, uh, interactively, um, but we rely on third party you know, uh, research repositories for actually minting DOIs and preserving artifacts for the long run. So uh, tails are intended to be publishable objects that can be uh, put into external repositories that have archival guarantees. Um, and then in addition to transparent, the notion of verifiable, I guess we've got kind of two definitions of verifiable in this context. One is that the, the resulting tail object that can be moved around the zip file that can be published uh, is verifiable. It has technical metadata, uh, hashes, whatnot, to ensure that the files are, that were in there are the ones that were originally there. So we use a, a standard called Bagot for that. And that, uh, that verifiable also in the sense of the journal verification policies that it's really intended for these things to be able to be um, assessed and verified in the sense of rerunning and ex uh, re-executing re a workflow and confirming reported results. So let's see, I'm just gonna show you a couple of examples here <clears throat> to highlight. Uh, so this is not a tail. Uh, this is 
for the American Journal of Political Science. They have this policy that researchers have to share all of the code, all of the data, and sufficient information for a third party, in this case, the Odom Institute, to reproduce those results and confirm that any analytical results, figures, tables, et cetera, are reproducible. Um, so this is put into Dataverse, which is uh, it's a fair, fairly commonly used research data repository, at least in the social sciences, linked back to a peer-reviewed publication. Um, so a tale built on this, just to show you the difference, this one's been published to Zenodo, um, contains all of that information, plus information about installed packages in the environment, a reference to a container image hosted in Holtail's uh, image registry. And in this case, uh, it's a concept I'll go over in a second here called a recorded run, which is an independent execution of that workflow that produced the uh, figures, you know, any, any of the results that would have been reported in the manuscript. So the notion of the recorded run in this case is kind of to that end of transparency, where if you use that feature of whole tail, someone doesn't actually need to re-execute what you've done because they can trust that the run of this code with this version of the code is actually what produced the results. Uh, I guess the other side of that is that this can be easily re-imported back into whole tail and re-executed. So I would pull up the environment that the author selected with their code, with their data, and have access to that executed run. So the idea of a recorded run, so you have a, a workspace in whole tail, which I'll go over in a second. That's just a directory that's got your, your code. Uh, you can reference data externally or your data can be in there. So the recorded run would create a version of your artifacts, uh, ensure that it's got the correct version of a container image if you've made any changes to say packages, execute a workflow that's specified by you, and it captures an immutable copy of all of the outputs from that. Um, it'll capture system and runtime information uh, so folks can know downstream what types of resources were used as a part of the process too, uh, what kind of resources that they would require to rerun. So Holtail's approach to computational reproducibility and transparency um, is to allow researchers to run their code on an external system while capturing information about the computational environment. So through the container image, we get the operating system, the version of software that was used specifically for an execution that produced results. And then to you know, easily publish those artifacts to long-term research archives. Um, it's a web-based platform. So we'll authenticate using an institutional identity, access commonly used environments, and then we're very happy to add new environments. So primary ones are Jupyter, uh, R, we've got support for MATLAB's data, Julia also through uh, the binders the infrastructure. And this is, the environment customization is based on Project Jupyter's binder. So the underlying configuration of which packages are installed. Uh, it uses binder as component. Uh, we have extended that for MATLAB and Stata, which are not supported there because they require uh, commercial licenses. So, and then you can reference data in the system by pulling it in from external repositories. Uh, and then you can publish out to archival repositories to get an identifier. Um, yeah, we've got, you know, at this point, Thousands of people have used this system um, for various purposes, either research, exploration, tutorials, assignments. We've got classes that have used it as well across a variety of domains. Um, obviously, we're uh, we, this is a, I think we did a tutorial last May for CSDMS. This is our second time talking to the CSDMS community. Um, all right, and I'm just I'm going to jump into kind of a demonstration that's based on that 2022 tutorial. Uh, and I guess I can drop a link to this slide deck if it into the chat if anybody's interested. And I can share this um, as well. But that um, GitHub repository has got a fairly detailed <clears throat> tutorial that you can walk through. I guess I'll actually, if anybody's got, I guess I, you're not opening to questions yet, right, Albert? Because I, it's a breaking point if anybody had any specific questions for this part of the presentation. Yeah, we, I mean, if, if you're uh, if you're fine with it, uh, it's it's fine with me if uh, people ask questions. Uh, 
One other thing, Greg, I clicked on the link and it asks for oh. uh, access. You, you okay. need access, let me, so. Let me fix that then. Okay. It should have been within an hour. Yep. You try again, it should be shared with everybody. Yeah, I can get to it now. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, without further ado, I'll give a quick look at Holtail, the Holtail dashboard. And I'm going to do this in uh, oh, I'm screen sharing still, correct? Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can. Why? Well, I don't know why I'm not seeing the zoom out line. Okay. I'm going to go for an incognito window just so you see the first time user experience dashboard.holtail.org. And I'm going to also come over here and look at an example that's been published. So a change that we implemented after actually uh, some feedback, including some feedback from the last tutorial. Uh, when you come into Holtail now, you don't it doesn't require authentication initially. So you can view anything that's been shared with you or that's been made public within our system um, <clears throat> just directly. I can see if my... I guess I didn't make my land lab. Uh, this is Bertram CST, so it's a land lab tutorial. So you can view metadata, you can view files, et cetera, without needing to log in. Uh, but most other ac actions require you to, to actually sign in. Uh, Holtail uses Globus's authentication service. It's convenient because it allows us to use your institutional login uh, to get in. Some people get concerned about the privacy, the consent and privacy policies. Uh, the other reason we use it, if you're familiar with Globus, is we can transfer data um, from Globus endpoints into Holtail on your behalf if granted permission. So if you've never used the system before, there will be a consent form there. Um, nope. So you can use ORCID, um, you can use Google account. Here's the consent form. I, I cleared my consent so you could see this. So it's allowing us to initiate transfers for you and for users of Deriva services, um, <clears throat> which is a specific integration that we have. And then just typical identity information, use your email address. View your email address to show information about you in the system. So we have the notion of public tales, uh, tales that have been shared with you within the system, so you can collaboratively work on the same uh, on the same tale. And then your personal tales are things that you own. Um, you can create a new tale, and three mechanisms for that. So one, it'll just be an empty tale. I'll show you that one. We can create one based on the Git repository. And whole tale doesn't require use of Git, but it also doesn't preclude it. So if you're a Git user. Um, you can use Git from within the um, interactive environments, but part of Holtail's design is intended for people who aren't regular Git users uh, to also be able to publish things like binders. And then you can also create a tail from a digital object identifier. So if it's one of the supported integrations, uh, we can pull that in either as a reference data set or uh, as something that you're going to act on. So I'll just create a blank. Uh, webinars, tail. You can pick from a variety of environments. I'm going to pick JupyterLab because I feel like uh, CSDMS is predominantly maybe Python-based uh, community. Uh, I will note for MATLAB, and you're not state of users, for MATLAB users, we're leveraging um, the network license at Jetstream, which is at Indiana University. So you, you can use MATLAB using an um, uh, institutional license that but images from Holtail require you to have your own license if you use them locally. So here, just tail metadata page is your default, um, you know, typical stuff that we would add. Uh, this gets translated at publication time, publish time to your uh, remote repository. We can add files, folders, uh, 
to the, what's called the tail workspace. This is your primary directory. Uh, you can, I'm not gonna cover this today, but it's in our documentation. You, If you use external data and you don't wanna include it, like it's a published data set that you're analyzing, we do it by reference. So your tail will always be connected to that and it can be pulled in. We cache it for you during analysis, but it's not something that you republish. Right. Then, you know, the main thing here is the uh, interactive environment. So what's gonna happen is we're gonna spin up a, in this case, a Jupyter Lab instance <clears throat> that's running on whole tails infrastructure uh, and just present to you that interface. And if you're familiar with Jupyter, Jupyter Lab, it's the basic interface. All actions are still usable here, so you can upload and manage files directly. <clears throat> I'm trying to, not going to recreate the land lab example here. So once you have your tail, you, you know, you can run uh, commands in the terminal, you can create notebooks, you can execute anything interactively that you can do in Jupyter Lab. Yeah, you can do via whole tail. And the operations that we now have on our tail menu allow you to do a few things. Administratively, you can look at the logs of that running container in case uh, you have issues like code that creates errors that don't that aren't apparent uh, within the, the interactive development environment. If you make changes to configuration, adding packages, uh, you can rebuild that container image, which is what the rebuild tail does, and restart the tail using that. Uh, rebuilt container image. You can save a version of your work. Uh, so that'll show up in the version panel here. Um, you can initiate a recorded run. So this would uh, allow you to initiate a some master script that executes. And I'll demonstrate that here with the land love example in a second. We can publish and export. Um, so publishing would publish, say, to Zenodo. We have to connect to Zenodo to do so, an export would give you a zip file that you can operate on locally. Uh, from this, we also have the ability to share with other users within the system. So I think if Albert, uh, if Albert is here, here we go, I can share a tail with Albert, I can give him permission to view it, in which case he would be able to um, make a copy of that to edit. He can view my tail, but he can't run and modify files within it. Uh, so if he wants to run it and execute, say, notebook steps or execute code that produce output, he'll make a copy or I can uh, he can co-own or co-edit this with me. We don't share container instances, but uh, he would be able to modify the files as I can. So here is a published tail that I've uh, published as a sandbox <clears throat> yesterday that's got a land lab tutorial on it. And this is just a demonstration of how that tail can be brought back into whole tail. Um, with, there we go. Sorry for the slowness. So you can, you know, once you publish to an archival repository, <clears throat> you can delete that object from whole tail and it can always be re-imported. It can be re-imported by somebody else. Uh, that should have taken me to, that should have taken me into that interface. So, so here we see my land lab example. Um, it was published to Zenodo and brought back into our system on March 8th. It's got a simple Python script that generates some very simple figures based on a tutorial. There was one version of this at the point in time that I published, and it had a recorded run, which means that uh, that run.sh was executed and generated the figures that were in the subdirectory. So now I can bring up this tail that was published uh, to Zenodo. It was it's a Jupyter Lab tail. So in addition to, so it's a very simple master script that just runs a simple Python script that was taken directly from the land lab tutorial materials that just produces a couple of figures. Also, what's interesting, this environment YAML. So this is one of the, the 
you want to configure your environment, Wholetail requires you to use the convention that repo to Docker. These are typically um, common package manager formats, so environment.yaml for Conda. So this has installed a set of dependencies into the container image um, that allow me to run LandLab. So this built image uh, could have any package that you want in it as long as it, it, as long as it installs under Linux, because these are assumed to be, I should have said that up front, these are uh, Ubuntu-based images. So as long as you can run within a Linux environment, you can declare the dependencies for your uh, workflow. <clears throat> Once that image is built, anybody who brings that back into the system uh, has that environment either as a recipe that the image can be rebuilt or uh, via the image that was actually hosted in Holtail. So I can, yeah, again, from within um, here, I've got a full interactive terminal. I can run that land lab example myself. Uh, it will generate some figures that are viewable by me in the interactive space. I could just publish this right now, independent of a recorded run. And it's, you know, it's still reproducible. It's still useful but no one knows that I actually ran the code to produce those figures uh, in this context. I could have uploaded them from another source. So back to the idea of a run. So the run the run script is really just going to do that same command I did. And this will there'll be some notifications that come up. So this is now running in an isolated container using the image that would be associated with that run, so the container image. Um, and once I have that run, so there's one from yesterday, one from today, they're mostly identical. Um, I can go back through the process of publishing. So I would publish to Zenodo Sandbox. And it would actually, in this case, update that same instance of that same record uh, in Zenodo, just with a new version, uh, since this already had one. And it, that, uh, that obviously wouldn't work for someone who uh, isn't me. Since it's me, I'm allowed to update and create a separate version. <clears throat> I'm not going to go through the publish process right now. So let's see. Um, Due to the network issues with Jetstream, running locally was not convenient, but I can take my code out of Holtail uh, as a zip file. So I've downloaded that locally and I'll get it, just gonna get a terminal up here. And there's a script in here that just says run local. I'm on a Mac. So you have to have Docker in order to do this. Um, the script does assume a Linux-based system right now. So that's Windows support is something we are weak on. Um, so what this is going to do is do verification on the downloaded package using uh, the Bagot format. So this is just making sure everything is as it should be from a checksum standpoint. And it's going to pull the image from Holtail. Um, that is the built environment that I ran uh, to create this package, and it will start that locally. I'm not going to do that because it, the uh, downloading from this registry was not working for me this morning with their network problem. So uh, this is just to show that you have, it's it's sort of a weak point with Holtail. The publisher, the repositories that we publish to tend not to want us to deposit images uh, into their records, so we maintain a registry. Uh, but Holtail is a non-archival system right now. That's a step we're moving towards <clears throat> is uh, actually having some archival guarantees behind the images. Uh, but for right now, I mean, that's uh, we support them as best we can, the built images, but you can all, they can always be rebuilt from the recipe later. <clears throat> Let's see. I guess I can go through a went faster than I expected. So I'll go ahead and uh, look at the registered data, external data uh, case. So 
if you rely on externally published data, something that already has <clears throat> an identifier. So I'm gonna go take uh, an example identifier from that tutorial. Oh. Which is apparently not working at the moment. One moment. This is not something I tested earlier. Okay, I'm not going to do this at this point. Um, Sorry about that. I <clears throat> the issues with Jetstream. This is one area that I didn't test prior to signing, getting on for the webinar today. So I'm just going to go <clears throat> into a few plan features. Um, what we're working towards is a part of the platform right now. Uh, there's been actually a number of requests for Visual, Visual Studio Code support, uh, which is something that should be added. I would have hoped it was in there today, but it's not uh, implemented yet. As a part of a collaboration with, um, I guess, with Albert and with the uh, Comsys community, we've got a, propo a proposal in right now for NSF to expand whole tail uh, in a few key areas. So one is the ability to create tails locally, so a toolkit that you can run on your laptop or on uh, your own server to create these objects that don't require you to use our cloud interface. Integration with GitHub uh, through uh, GitHub webhooks where you're not, if you're a GitHub centric user where you can benefit from some of the features of Holtail without necessarily having to go again into the IDE um, since our interface is required for all of you to use all of the features right now. Support for increased resources uh, in terms of memories and cores and specialized resources, GPU access, which we have now in Jetstream 2, and as well as support for HPC and HTC workflows. Uh, so the ability to create tail-like objects and things like recorded runs through batch clusters uh, while you know, recognizing some of the special requirements for large-scale computational work. Um, so things like building singularity images, um, allowing users to uh, selectively include or exclude intermediate data, et cetera. Um, the whole tale is an open source project and increasingly we're moving towards community. A lot of the development occurred based on primary NSF funding, but we're moving much more to a community-based model if anybody's, if you're ever interested in joining, our Slack is open. Uh, it's an invitation link here. It's also on the Holtail website. The members of the Holtail organization are not just Holtail project members. It's a lot of people who are very interested in reproducibility, transparency, replicability, and research um, across a number of domains. So it's got it's a it's a good group. Um, and then uh, there's our GitHub, uh, which we've got you know, probably about 30 member contributors uh, and growing. And I'm that's the end of my presentation. I'm early, um, but I will open it up for Q&A, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Uh, that was very cool. Um, there we have a question from Anna. Um, and it's in the chat. Uh, so yeah. Anna indicated, you know, what are the terms of use for Holtail? Yeah. And uh, can it be used uh, for classes or workshops, even in a, in a non-academic setting? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, no, I should have gone over this at the very beginning. Thank you, Anna, <laughs> the question. So... <clears throat> It's yeah, it is in for academic use only. Uh, that's also the policy of Jetstream and our access to the Mat, the MATLAB and Stata licenses. So it can be used for classes and workshops. Um, and I'd have to understand the context of a non academic one. So, yeah, if it's a 
anything within kind of a commercial context, it would be it's not allowed within the terms of use. Um, but if it's outreach education related, that's in kind of that gray area. It's not specifically an academic class, but it's a uh, um, outreach to a research community, et cetera, then I think that would probably be reasonable. The compute resources for a tail. So by default, it's kind of a, right now we're a laptop in the cloud. Um, we've got some limitations on the underlying VM size at Jetstream. I think the, there's a soft cap of, I think it's eight gigs of RAM for a tail, but that can be extended. Uh, I think that probably, a, if I'm remembering, it should be 16 gigs of RAM right now. So these are not, this is not for large, not, and that's not even very large. These are not for larger work, but that's an area if you want to use whole tail for that, please reach out to me because um, that will motivate us to actually increase some of those caps. Those caps can be, uh, they can be increased. Then we have uh, a question from Katie. Um, Katie, can you, yes. And then yeah, then... thank you. So I'm, thanks so much for the presentation. Um, I have a couple of questions I've written down. Um, I'm at the USGS in Golden, Colorado, where I do a lot of work on computational, um, computational work in landslide hazards. Um, and I am, I, I'm gonna give a little bit of a preamble, which is that I am often working in a situation in which I am developing the software that is being used. And then on top of that, there's some workflow that is being used to run a set of jobs. And I'm also in this category of people who, you know, I may be doing a set of runs that are, you know, like hundreds of say two day wall time, 40 node mm -hmm. job runs on a slurm cluster. And then there's a post-processing phase. And so I'm, I'm curious about what, and I think this based on your prior answers, you know, some of these are like in the, the future of, of whole tail, sort of what the vision is on supporting of multi-phase um, analysis of sort of yep. the runs and then the post-processing and so forth um, and, and sort of where what the cap current capabilities are and sort of what the vision for where that's going is. All right. And I'll say uh, it's very nice to meet you because we used one of your GitHub repositories as an example and some of our work for the Trimus proposal, because it's exactly, it's like transparent work that's extremely well documented. It's obviously not automated because you've got a lot of steps that are in there. So I'm familiar at least with one of your publications where I think you did some of this stuff. This is um, this is the one that has to do with um, predicting erosion of the nuclear waste repository maybe? Was it nuclear, it was like a multi-article publication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, and that's, that's the kind of thing that, yeah. I mean, it's I like I. I think it's a little tenuous to say what that is or isn't, since nothing is dem demonstrated. And you know, we ran into a lot of issues with data archiving there. It was very hard. You know, we ended up right. having to make sort of like a a pointer into a Globus. Anyway, I'll sort of. Well, no. So this is so these are cases. So there's a yeah long running thing in whole tail is something we call tails at scale. And the two the two pieces of tails at scale were that a lot of researchers we've got we've astro community that do massive simulations they can't put their data anywhere. Unfortunately, they're not as concerned about reproducibility. I mean, fortunately for them, but not for us. Um, economics, even you know, it's a much smaller percentage for the American Economic Association. But obviously, work gets done on campus clusters and exceed resources. Um, and they can't verify that stuff. That's one problem, right? There's no journal policy of going through and rerunning the code and can happen. Um, but often they don't have the confidence that stuff was run as it was stated, right? Because it's if it's multi-phase where there's human steps involved and multiple people, there's a lot of risk of potential error, I guess, right? Like in, uh, in the reproducibility context. So we're very interested in this. This is actually one of the key points for the proposal that we put in uh, for CSSI. We have a secondary project right now that's um, coming out of economics. So they have the added bonus of uh, 
private data, you know, you're using census data, census resources that are access controlled. So if you want to be transparent running on census resources where you can't share the data and it's their compute infrastructure, that gets kind of tenuous. So um, trace is not, I guess one piece of that is there's a component we'll be implementing for Slurm to help not instrument Slurm in a deep way, but to help like it would be like an isolated queue where we can trace stuff that happened and report and provide information from a transparency standpoint. This really happened on this cluster. And, you know, these are the outputs. Um, but again, you know, long running compute and enormous data that doesn't have a home or you know, remain big challenges for for everybody but for us as well but yeah this is like it's it's something we're eager to work on um and that, yeah. that's a part of it it's like cloud-based whole tail does you no good but using some of the tooling to create a provenance trace with some guarantee that people can know that you ran something and they you know increasing kind of trust in what your outputs are is kind of where we're headed Awesome. Thank, thank Does that you. make sense? Okay. Does yeah, that answer the yeah, question? I rambled a lot there. So. I mean, it, yeah, I, I don't know that this is a feasible thing, but you know, it makes me think I've recently started to use snake make a lot because okay. it is flexible enough for what I, my reality, but I can sort of, but uh, you know, I, it, unless you specify every single input and output file that is being made, you're sort of not necessarily you're not truly archiving like that this was run on this platform, but I can imagine maybe the sort of like snake make generating uh, yeah. series of interrelated tales could be a very valuable. Um, yep, and that's, I'm sorry, that's the other, um, that's uh, Larsville Hubert, who's the data editor for AEA has been long pushing us for, uh, and this is part of the trace project as well the chaining of these things, right? Yeah. So that outputs of one become in the inputs to another step, but they might have other dependencies. They might be completely isolated jobs that get done. So yes, that's, again, that's part of Trace. Trace is gonna be a lot more lightweight, I think. Um, but yeah, I'd say you do this, if you're ever interested in talking about it, or, you know, as a case, like if you've got research that could inform what we're doing, I think we'd be very interested, so. Yeah. Yeah, I may I may follow up um, okay. on that because I think you know I'm sorry I'm I'm dominating this conversation, oh. but hopefully people find this interesting. But that you know the kind of thing that I'm facing is you know running hazard assessments for post fire debris flows for every large fire on public land in the Western U.S. every year, and I you know that's a thing that takes substantial computational resources, and I think it's important as a government employee doing science to demonstrate that that, you know, what it is and where it's going um, and, and what went into it and what came out of it. Um, but, you know, how that, but, um, you know, it's a real, uh, it's a real lift <laughs> to learn the tools to do that well. Right. Um, yep. And, and uh, you know, so I want to make sure I'm on top of that, because I think at the USGS, we, you know, we have a lot of requirements in terms of um, archiving our data and increasingly archiving our code. And there's sort of internal discussions about what it means to sort of archive something that isn't really data and isn't really code, but is like a, a data and a code that all go together. Yeah. So anyway, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. That was a great question. And then I'm glad I ended my demo early then. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Um, we have another uh, question in the chat from Steve. I'm Steve. I'm wondering, do you want to elaborate a little bit on this, or shall I read it out? I see you're unmuted, but I cannot hear. I can you. answer it. I see it here. So uh, people, okay. People ask. Okay. Yeah, Steve has problems okay. with that. Uh... Yeah, so I mean, provenance, computational provenance is, uh, is at least two folks on the hotel project that have been deeply engaged uh, with that. Uh, so we would think there's the different notions of provenance, like just the, the artifact chain of custody provenance in terms of uh, handing off something that was produced on one system to another system versus 
computational provenance in terms like what files were accessed, which code was responsible for producing which outputs. Um, and let's see. So yes, that's a thing. Uh, not as much of it as we wanted is actually in the primary whole tail system. Uh, I think we moved, this is not part of your question. We moved away from the S trace methods, uh, S and P trace methods of tracking stuff within the system because it was just too risky and too intensive. But Tim McPhillips, who uh, led a lot of the provenance work, um, was looking at eBPF trace methods uh, for tracing stuff internally that should be more performant. All technical stuff, but we're still working in this area, or he is, uh, certainly. So can I point you to a link that summarizes our current approach to recording provenance information? Uh, in terms of whole tail, do we have a good, and I, if you can answer this question, Steve, in the chat, are you talking about computational provenance, like the sort of S-trace, repro-zip, eBPF trace model, or are you talking about something else? Okay. So the short answer to the, your first question is no, but the follow-on answer is that I can ensure that we can provide you with that information and get our docs in the state to answer the question. So I wanna make sure I know um, which side. So I don't think we have a good summary right now. Uh, that's something I'll take away from this session. Most people aren't interested in the point of the system. Um, and I guess you could absolutely feel free to reach out to me. Uh, yeah, the prob implementation. So I think what he had implemented was used ReproZip as the data collection mechanism, and then he post-processed the what was pulled out of the kind of the S-trace output there to generate triples from uh, actual like the um, prob graph kind of model, which he's the expert at, but. In the end, the ReproZip implementation was pulled because of both security and performance concerns. And so now what we do is not really provenance. It's very, from the computational standpoint, it's um, it's really just resource, like resource usage information and then the notion of the recorded run where we know that something was run independently. Those are the kind of assertions that we can make, but we don't have um, what was a part of that, some of the design uh, and some of the work that he's done there in the system yet. Thank you. Then there is uh, one last follow-up from uh, Anna regarding computer resources. Um, yeah, Anna is wondering, yeah, if there, how many cores are available if you want to run something? I'll have to look at the underlying. I mean, look, we migrated to Jetstream too, so I don't know. I can pull up there um, if I can get into the Horizon interface. I can get the specific cores. We don't. I, don't know that we put a cap on cores so you get what's on the underlying VM, um, which I want to say it's going to be probably four or eight. I can't remember mm -hmm. with the migration. So I can answer that in a second. Yeah, and that is. And I'll say, oops, sorry, I'll just, just a quick follow up on that. So we're trying to be good stewards of Jetstream's resources. So we don't want to provision machines that aren't used um, and resources that aren't, you know, where we're consuming stuff. So that's a, the more demand we have for stuff that is bigger, we can provision larger VMs and utilize those as part of whole tail. Uh, and I know that's the, you know, we're asking people to demand it for us to do it, which is problematic, but, um, the more feedback we get like this is good. So I guess the follow on to you, Anna, Anna is uh, what would you like to see? <laughs> what kind of resources would be uh, uh, useful in your context? Oh, actually, so, well, I have to say, so the underlying VM is actually six, that we went larger with this deployment. So it's a 16 core. Uh, for an individual, <clears throat> so your tail instance can go up to 16. And actual RAM on that then is 60. So, um, and there's ways for us, there's actually a, a limit that can be increased via an advanced setting in whole tail that like can let you go there. So that's, if I, 
Casper for provision these, I think. So we're 1660 are the numbers, uh, the actual absolute maximum. <clears throat> Rick, I, I have one last question. Um, and this is uh, maybe a little bit technical, but if you are, um, if you have published a manuscript and you, you made a, a repository in Holtail on the, through the whole Holtail gateway with, um, you know, People can uh, rerun your stuff or, or go through the code and, and kind of see where, you know, how you came to your findings. Um, so publication is published, link is there. And, you know, a few months later, somebody points out, mm, there might be a bug in your code, you know, revisit. And it, it doesn't change anything to the results, but yes, indeed, there is, you know, a small bug in the, in the workflow or something. Can you still, change your 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 instance that you created um and save it so the link in the paper still points to the you know to kind of the updated uh, repository or or are there yeah. other ways to guide people to to the newer version that that uh, read a book or or some yeah miss some typo is uh, corrected yeah, so I'll just show you quickly here. So publishing, to, this is where Holtail itself is not the, you don't want to give our URL out, right, to uh, for publication. You want to deposit somewhere and rely on Zenodo's infrastructure to, you know, to host it in the long run. Yeah. <clears throat> so here's an example. This is just a test. In fact, here's here's one of my, like, key ugly use case tests where I test every new release that we have. I own it. It's my key to Zenodo. I produced it. The tail is in whole tail. I've never deleted it, but that's my working environment. Um, and each time mm -hmm. I republish, this is the nice thing about some of the research data infrastructure is that as long as that relationship is maintained in the tail of the original object, like I'll republish, I'll get a new version. Mm -hmm. So Zenodo has this idea of the, they called it like the context DOI. This is the top level DOI that references the latest version, and then they give identifiers for each subsequent version. So I think classically you'd give one to your, um, you know, that's attached to the manuscript, and then later you go and change it. You would still link to that, but they would know that there were newer versions in the um, in the Zenodo record. Very nice. Thank you. Um... Let's see, I see a few things in the uh, in the chat, but I, there are more thank yous than, and comments than questions. If there are no other questions, we are about to uh, do the hour, then I think this is it. Um, Greg, thank you very much for, for your presentation, for walking us through a uh, whole tale and um, yeah, thank you. The recording will be uh, provided in the coming two, three hours or something on the CSDMS page. Uh, maybe Lynn can send out uh, the link to the recording. Uh, yep, so you I can will share do that. It with, so it can be shared uh, with your colleagues. Thank you. Yep. And, and I just, just one follow up here for uh, Anna yep. and anybody else who's interested in using the system for a class. Um, Please feel free to reach out to me directly if you want to talk about like class size uh, and some of the resource issues. It's good for us to know, uh, you know, particularly if it's a lot of students. Um, so your experience is good. So if you intend to use it or you want to or talk more about it, we're totally open for it. And just uh, feel free to reach out to me. That goes for anybody. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. Oh, this was great. Thank you, Albert. Thank you, Lynn, for the opportunity. And this was great. Thanks.